you catch more flies with honey than vinegar. Bean feast, musical fruit. Mario eat, Mario do. The pears and the feast of joy. You can't say anything nice, don't say it at all. Fly on, share it another. Good morning, Groton Bible Chapel. My name is Zach. I'm one of the pastors here. Welcome. So glad you are here with us to worship and, and study God's word with us this morning. We just got to hear some words of wisdom from some of our young people and GBC kids. Uh, as we jump into this new sermon series, Summer with Solomon, a few days ago, I went to our GBC community Facebook page and just asked, what kind of sayings did you grow up with? And got some really interesting results. And we'll be hearing more of those as the summer goes on. Uh, when we were making the decision, Gary and Jason and myself, on, on the summer sermon series, we, we consciously decided that we were gonna dive into waters that we don't normally wade through on Sunday mornings. And so, uh, stuff that we don't honestly give a lot of attention to. And if you've been a Christian for a while, chances are, right, that you have pr a proverb on like a cup, a mug, a shirt, a piece of decor somewhere in your house. But we wanted to dive into uh, uh, the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. And you see, we turn to all sorts of other places in the Bible for different things, right? Some of you like history. You go to, to Joshua and you go to Kings and you, you look at the action and the betrayal and the fighting, right? Braveheart's got nothing on the life of David. Uh, others, you're more interested in the Gospels and you just kind of camp there. My, many of us appeal or we find ourselves often in different kinds of genres. And for whatever the reason, we don't often find ourselves in a place like Ecclesiastes or Song of Songs. Yes, you, we will have a sermon by Brandon Barnes on Song of Songs. And so uh, uh, for us, what we wanna do is just take some time to go through and look at wisdom. And God has gifted us several books known as wisdom literature. I really like what one uh, uh, commentator has to say. He compares the law with wisdom. He, he says, the law commands, but wisdom advises, warns, and persuades. The law stands on the foundation of God's covenant requirements, but wisdom speaks from experience and points to probable results. The law points a finger in your face and just tells you what not to do. Wisdom puts an arm around your shoulder and urges you to think twice. Our hope this summer is to give you a whiff, and I say the word whiff in a positive way, right? A whiff of wisdom in the Bible, right? That is, you can imagine walking by a really nice smelling restaurant on the way to an appointment that you're like, ooh, I need to come back there. Our hope is that as we just touch base briefly in the Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and Psalms and Song of Songs, that it gives you the opportunity to have a little exposure so that you can go back and hopefully dive a bit more deeply. Before we uh, talk more, I'm gonna, actually, we, we had several people from our 20s uh, group, uh, uh, college and 20s, that are gonna read some of the scripture that we're gonna be referencing over the next seven weeks. You can take a look at that now. Ecclesiastes 5.10. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. Proverbs 1.7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. And Proverbs 28, 6. Better is a poor man who walks in his integrity than a rich man who is crooked in his ways. Psalm 127, verses 1 to 2. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Check it. Songs of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 7. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or the does of the field, that you not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. 
Really grateful for, again, people from our 20s ministry jumping in. If you're interested, young adult ministry, you can go to our website, Connect Ministries, and learn more. Would love for you to plug in. Uh, so those are some of the scriptures that we're going to be diving into this summer. There's more kind of beyond that. That's just a sampling. Before uh, we, we look specifically into these books, because today is less of a sermon and more of an introduction. I'm introducing the literature that we're going to be talking about. One of the questions that comes up inevitably is authorship. Now, we call the series Summer with Solomon, and we could have called it Summer with Wisdom, Summer with Solomon just sounds better. Let's be real, right? But as we talk about these different books, the question of authorship comes up. And regardless, right, of, of where we land on authorship, we have to, our starting point is that Solomon, the man, the king, who lived approximately a thousand years before Jesus, who, who ruled over in a very, very successful time in the people of Israel, who was the final king in the, in the united monarchy right before Israel and Judah split, that God came to him and said, I will give you a request. And he asked for wisdom and was known as the wisest man who ever lived. And, and after that, he would go on to write 3,000 proverbs, 1,000 songs. He would contribute and shape the wisdom literature of the Israelite people from that point on. And so everything that we're going to look at bears, in some sense, the fingerprints, right, of Solomon. That Proverbs very explicitly uh, uh, it quotes Solomon all throughout. And we're going to go through some Proverbs by Solomon and some not by Solomon. That in the book of Psalms, there's two in particular that are ascribed to Solomon as their author. We're going to take a look at those. And they kind of bear the resemblance of the Proverbs within them. We're going to look at Ecclesiastes, which is, is more hotly debated roughly 150 years ago. Higher criticism, sounds a little arrogant to put it that way, but higher criticism uh, noted the style and the language of Ecclesiastes and said there's no way that was written a thousand years before Jesus. And then, of course, a few decades later, they discovered writings, wisdom literature from peoples around Solomon during his time, and it had the same kind of style and language. And so it's still a little disputed. And finally, the Song of Songs actually references Solomon eight or nine times. And so whether or not it's written by him or about him or with him in mind, again, Solomon's fingertips, right, as a contributor and a shaper of the wisdom tradition of God's people, we're going to be spending our summer with Solomon. So with that kind of intro out of the way, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to dive in. Lord, I ask you, God, that you would be in our midst during this time. Lord, that as we kick off this new summer series, Lord, that we would be open and receptive to the wisdom you have for us, God, uh, that this would be an opportunity to learn, Lord, uh, to go places we haven't before in the word. And so, God, give us an open heart. Lord, may, uh, may, may what is true, what is good, what is edifying, Lord, stand and stick, and may all else, God, just fade away. We ask for clarity and humility, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, church, we're going to start in the book of Proverbs, right? So you can actually open up to Proverbs 3, Proverbs roughly in the middle of the Bible. Uh, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. I'm going to start reading it now. CSB it says, happy, some translations say blessed, happy is a man who finds wisdom and who acquires understanding. I want to pause there for a second, right, because some of you, as we talk about wisdom, as we talk about making righteous and upright and just decisions in our life, right? Because wisdom is kind of, is knowledge applied, right? That as we talk about wisdom, some of your antennas go up uh, and confuse very easily wisdom with this idea of works righteousness. And so I just want to be very clear early on that we cannot confuse the two. That that he who knew no sin became sin, Jesus, so that we might become the righteousness of God. And so my righteousness comes from Jesus, and that's what gets me right standing before God. Nothing I do. You cannot wisdom yourself to heaven. Just be very, very clear. But that doesn't make wisdom any less important. Verse 14. 
For she, wisdom, is more profitable than silver. Her revenue was better than gold. She is more precious than jewels. Nothing you desire can equal her. Long life is in her right hand and her left riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant and all her paths peaceful. She is a tree of life to those who embrace her and those who hold on to her are happy. Now, I just got to throw this out there, right? That wisdom is personified by a woman here. Like, that's just kind of interesting, guys. I didn't do it. Like, God did that, not me, right? Uh, But it's it's just kind of interesting. But one of the things we see coming out of this passage, and I just, I have two points for us to consider this morning as a launching pad and to looking at these four books. And that is the first one is that wisdom is worth seeking. That in this passage, right, what do we see? That wisdom is profitable, it's precious, right? It's pleasant, it's past or peaceful, lots of P words. It makes it easy to read. I mean, it's poetry after all, but that re- wisdom is worth seeking. And the truth is in our society that we have a weird relationship with wisdom. In fact, there's three different kind of cultural currents that rail against uh, uh, the, what we see about wisdom in scripture, right? That, that run against this idea of seeking wisdom. Well, one of those cultural currents is, is kind of the surgence of the DIY. And I'm not saying you can't like do construction yourself in your house. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the attitude of I'll figure it out myself, right? There's a YouTube video for that. I'll figure it out myself. And one of those cultural currents is, is the YOLO, right? The you only live once, which by the way, ignores this tiny important thing we call eternity. But the YOLO person, one that says, I don't care about the consequences. I'm just gonna enjoy whatever pleasure or thrill or, or whatever comes in this particular moment. Again, despite the consequences. I don't care if, that's the right way, and if I know it's the right way, it's just not what I want right now. I remember when my wife found out she was allergic to dairy, she, uh, we got rid of all the dairy, and like four months later, she went on a trip, and so I decided I hadn't had mac and cheese in a really long time, so I went to the grocery store, I got milk, I got, I got extra cheese, I got butter, right? Butter on butter, on cheese, on cheese, on milk, on milk. It was a dairy fest, right? And my body hadn't had it in a long time. And so I spent uh, three minutes devouring it. And then I spent the next 12 hours sleeping in the bathroom, right? YOLO, flush. Not a lot of fun. It's one of the part of the cultural currents in our day. And the the final cultural current is is what I like to call the scoffer, right? The what do they know? There's this kind of cultural current as technology develops faster and faster, as we gather more data and more information faster and faster, that we, we come to think or assume that just because it's new means it's better. It disregards and disrespects and devalues those that have come before and the insights they have to offer. Students, right, teenagers, listen, I'm talking to you. Students, your parents didn't grow up with a cell phone, okay? Your parents didn't grow up with social media. When they were kids, TikTok wasn't an app, it was just the sound a clock made, right? There's a lot of ways, and it's easy as, as for, for, for kids as they grow up to think, to get it in their head that, that their parents can't relate to the world they're growing up in because of how different it is. When I was, a, when I was in high school, if I wanted to chat with friends, you had to disable the phone line because you only had one. You brought up the dial-up internet, right, and you got an AOL instant messenger. It was barbaric times, I know. We get it in, the, in, our, in our heads, right, that, that they can't relate because things are just so different. When the truth is, the great majority of what we would call the human condition has gone unchanged. That your parents and your grandparents know what it is to love, to be heartbroken, to grieve loss, to just wanna belong and fit in, to celebrate triumph and victory, to grieve the bitterness of, of disappointment, what it is to feel isolated and alone. That those are experiences, right, that humanity shares, your parents included. 
And the truth is that some of the best insights into our world and to our own decision-making comes from those who've been there already, who have come before us. And the scripture provides that in different shapes and forms. And that wisdom is worth seeking, profitable, precious, pleasant, passive, peacefulness. It's worth seeking. And so I'm briefly going to go through the four books that we're going to look at, right? And there's technically six books that you could say that make up the majority of the wisdom literature in the Bible, right? You got James in the New Testament, brother Jesus, and then you have Job along with the four that we're looking at. Job is not going to get any love this summer, all right? We can talk about that another time, but that's there. And so we're going to start We're gonna look at Proverbs, Psalms, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs. And the first one is the Proverbs. Now, this photo that you see here is someone starting out on a journey, right? And the reason we picked that photo is because Proverbs has this air of positivity to it that you're about to set out to do something and it largely offers general truths to guide you, right? That if you do this, then this would happen. If you don't do this, then this would happen. They're not universal truths. They're general truths. That the majority of what you get in Proverbs, right, are this positive optimism at the beginning of a journey. If you could boil it down in that kind of way, right, that's overgeneralizing, I know, but you get what I'm trying to say. Then you get to Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes looks at wisdom in a far different way. Ecclesiastes, if Proverbs, right, is the optimism you have as you begin a journey, right? If Proverbs is about the decisions that you're gonna make and if, and if generally you do this, if generally you listen, if generally you don't put all your value in money, if generally you respond gently to harsh words, if generally, right, you do these things, then the result will be positive. But Ecclesiastes comes at it from a life well lived and with a life experience that has seen things not go to plan. You can imagine playing a game of cards, right? Personally, I love cribbage. I know we got some spades, some poker players, people. You can imagine playing a game of cards, right, in which you make every decision perfectly. You play the hand to the T exactly how the the, the best pro in the world would play it. But at the end of the hand, you just don't get the cards and you lose. That's Ecclesiastes. What does wisdom look like then? There's a phrase in Ecclesiastes you see throughout the book, hevel, hevel. Hevel is is vapor, breath. It's here for a moment and then it's gone translated vanity, oh vanities, also translated meaningless, meaningless. The idea is that Ecclesiastes looks at the amount of time and energy and resources we pour into things of this life that fade like that and are gone. And so how should we live, should we live accordingly then? I thought about when high schoolers graduate, and I heard this when I was a teen, and it, and it resonates so truly that, that when you go up at graduation and maybe it's a digital graduation, right? Or maybe it's in person and you go, you receive your diploma. You always give something in return. And that thing is your reputation because all the energy and time you spend investing and building up and caring what other people think, as soon as you graduate, it no longer matters. It's (sighs) hevel. There for a moment and then gone. And Ecclesiastes hits on this with life, written with the voice and the tone of the older cynic. Next, you have the Psalms. Now the Psalms, uh, Pastor Mark Dever of uh, Nine Marks Ministry, he, he calls Psalms the, the wisdom for, for the true spiritual life. Martin Luther called the Psalms the Bible in miniature. Abraham Lincoln uh, once confided to a friend, the Psalms are the best. I find something in them for every day of the year. That within the Psalms, as we come to the Psalms, that again, wisdom for the truly spiritual life, that we get wisdom when it comes to thanksgiving and praise and trust and remembering, even in moments of lamenting. Augustine of Hippo, 
once said this, if the psalm prays, you pray. If the psalm laments, you lament. If the psalm exalts, you rejoice. If it hopes, you hope. If it fears, you fear. Everything written here is a mirror for us. And so in the Psalms, we get a different kind of wisdom for spiritual life. And then finally, the Song of Songs. Now, some of you get a little, a little anxious. You hear about the Song of Songs. Some of you have never written there. You got to the verse where it talks about twin gazelles, right? And you're like, I'm out. I'm done. This is a book about wisdom with regard to intimacy. And some people have taken it as an analogy for Christ's relationship with the church and others have taken it uh, uh, as, as a narrative about two lovers and their relationship, right? And regardless of where you fall on that spectrum, we know that, that the Song of Songs, it is a song, it is poetry that gives us insight into relational intimacy from God's perspective. And so there's wisdom to be offered with respect to intimacy in the Song of Songs, And again, we're going to get a message on that towards the end of the year. And all of these things, right, wisdom is something to be sought. And so I encourage you with me this summer to actually read some of this stuff. To jump into Ecclesiastes over the next two weeks as, as we preach it. And to read it. To ask questions. To dive in. And we can go on that journey together. I'm going to come back to Proverbs 3. Picking up in verse 21 now. It says here, maintain sound wisdom and discretion. My son, don't lose sight of them. They will be life for you and adornment for your neck. The first part I mentioned that wisdom is worth seeking and I think it's important here to note that wisdom is also worth remembering. That it doesn't just go in one ear and out the other. That the text says maintain, right? Maintain, keep, cling to, hold on. Sound wisdom and discretion. Don't lose sight of them. Why? Two things. They will be life for you and adornment for your neck. That for those who pursue wisdom, who pursue, pursue godly wisdom for godly living, to live upright and God, God-fearing, Christ-exalting people, serving community-loving kind of lives, right? That, that for those people that there is a joy, a satisfaction, a richness associated with that kind of wisdom. And so with that, for those who seek and remember and hold on to, that wisdom will be life for you. And if that's, if that's true, and I've been thinking about that this week, like how, how much more motivated should I be to actually remember and be able to access this wisdom in everyday life? Like I could tell you a rolling stone gathers no moss, right? I could tell you uh, uh, there's two ways to skin a cat. I've never, I have no idea where that comes from or why anyone would want to skin a cat, right? But I know what it means, and, and, I, and I could reference that in everyday conversation. But how, how often would I be equipped in conversation with friends or with my kids to quote wisdom from Scripture? That in the midst of an argument, I can tell my son a gentle answer turns away wrath, right? But an angry word stirs up conflict. That that's wisdom that they can imbibe and remember that it would shape them. That as we, they grow older and we start talking about money, right? That whoever loves money will never be satisfied with what they have. Whoever loves wealth will never be satisfied with their income. That's wisdom, Ecclesiastes 5. And so I feel kind of the push, right? To, to equip myself over this summer with, with wisdom that I can pull into my daily life because that's what it's for. It's timeless wisdom, for everyday life. But it's not just, it doesn't just say they will be life for you. In verse 22, it says, and an adornment for your neck. I'm not a jewelry person, but I mean, I've seen people wear really, really nice jewelry and you look at that and you see a really nice necklace and it's easy to be like, that's beautiful. My wife has a ring on her finger. I wear one because it's what you do. Again, I'm not a jewelry person, right? But you see beautiful jewelry and you're like, that's beautiful. An adornment. That wisdom is an adornment. 
that others would look upon the person who lives a godly life and who makes decisions, right? Because they've sought out and they've, they've kind of been shaped by and maintained wisdom and they live out that wisdom in their life and that people would look and be like, that's beautiful. And that through us, they would see really the source, right? The, 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 the one who provides the wisdom and the one who the wisdom ultimately points to. I want to be very clear, right, as we talk through wisdom over the next uh, uh, seven weeks, it'd be very easy again to descend into works righteousness and to, and to do, 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 do. The truth of the matter is as we look at wisdom, we're reminded how often we fall short. And as we seek out what it is to live a godly life, we're reminded just how often we fall short. But what that does is it pushes us to lean into Jesus who never falls short, who lived perfectly on our behalf, who went to the cross to die the death we deserved, right? And so, again, as we learn together, grow together, journey together, we get to lean on Jesus, right? Not on our own effort, but on Jesus as we seek out to live a God-glorifying, Christ-exalting life together. I'm excited for this series, church. I hope you're excited too. I'm gonna go ahead and stop there. Why don't you, why don't you pray with me? Lord, I thank you again for bringing us here. God, I ask that as we think about wisdom this summer, Lord, that we would learn, that we would grow, that there'd be opportunities to connect. Lord, that if people feel kind of convicted to memorize things, that they would act on that, Lord, and that this summer would, again, just be a time of growth. So, Lord, we thank you for who you are, for what you've done for us. To you be the honor and the glory and the praise in Jesus' name. In Jesus' majestic and amazing and marvelous name. Amen.